in the name of my ancestors. Peace forever and always. Welcome to another edition of the Realities Tip on Earth. Of course, I am the host or the gatekeeper of this internet ministry. On YouTube, I am known as the Mighty, 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 mm. Angel Stub Love 7, your brother and hopefully your friend, Talik Even Rock. I hope you enjoy the video that follows this introduction. Again, peace forever and always and respect you. As we set fire to the Confederate flag, as we set fire to the sheets of the Klansmen, we remain proud to be African supremacists. You cracker loving Uncle Tom, House Negroes cannot infiltrate the structure of the African supremacists. We remain pure from the filth of interracial interbreeding. We remain pure from the filth of interracial relations. And last but not least, we remain pure of the pollution of Western civilization. One love under one nation. Africa, America, it's your brother, Tech Nine, host of the African Supremacy Blog Talk Radio Show. And I just want to say, black power to all of my brothers and sisters out there. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Oh, this is deep. Because the couple of verses I just read. is the second foundational pillar to the Pentecostal church. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Says who? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The Egyptians pronounce it Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you will take the information you've heard today and not let, don't take it as information to go out and tell other people they're wrong. That's not why I shared this information with you. Share this information with you to liberate you from the grasp of your oppressor. Because the very thing that your oppressor has been using is the very thing that you don't want to back away from. And that's the belief system that they gave you. If we as a people are going to ever be free, we're going to have to first realize that we knew God long before the white man had an awareness that he was even alive. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It amazes me how a people who have at least a 75,000 year history can all of a sudden not know who God is and be lost and undone and on their way to hell until they believe what somebody who just came out of the caves a few thousand years ago want to make you believe. As long as you keep buying into that mess, you will always be a slave. You will look like an African. You may even learn how to speak Kiswahili. You may understand the Metu and how to read it backward and forward. But as long as you're still stuck in there, 
parameters of thinking you're still a slave. And whenever they get ready, they will give you orders. And you will say, your order shall be obeyed. Without even realizing you're saying it. And guess what, brothers and sisters? They do it. Every time we start coming together as a people, they pull their little strings in our psycho viscera. And then the first thing you want to come and say, but do you believe in Jesus? Isn't that deep? We can come together on everything else. That one little line, that one question divides us. It's time for our resurrection and empowerment. The message I want to share with you today is entitled Christianity and World the Conquest. Now, if I don't get to turn to a Bible verse or a passage out of Lucia, don't worry about it. Okay? Here's the message today, Christianity and World Conquest. It has been said that religion is the opium of the masses. Y'all heard that before? Well, I went into the ministry in March of 1973. That's when I started preaching. So, preaching almost close to 30 years now, and having been an advocate of what I have been taught, notice how I'm saying that, what I have been taught is the divinely inspired Word of God. It has been very disturbing to me to find out that much of what I have been taught is, or what I've been taught to be the mind of God, is really nothing more than the personal scruples, desires of some of the most mentally twisted and sadistic European rulers in history. There's a book entitled King James VI of Scotland and First of England from 1603 to 1625. The author of this book is named Antonia Frazier. There's another book called The Wisest Fool in Christendom. The Reign of... The subject of that forum was supposed to be the credibility of the Bible and the origins of Christianity. In all fairness to those who were looking forward to the information, I felt that I should just go ahead and present that information today. But instead of calling today's subject, now I, I'm not even going to try to put both of those topics in a one hour lecture. And y'all did hear me say lecture, didn't you? All right, so y'all don't be disappointed if I don't preach All right. this morning. I want to give you some information. I want, I want to give you some knowledge here today. Okay? Instead of calling this the credibility of the Bible, I want to call it the incredibility of the Bible. You know, it's really deep, brothers and sisters, because all through Bible college, all through seminary, uh, in my higher schools of learning, I have heard my professors say so many times, the Bible is the most incredible book in the world. You know, I would hear my professors say, the Bible is just incredible. It's an incredible book. Oh, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And most times when I have heard that word, I always perceived it as saying, it's awesome. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's just that tight. It's just that right. You know what I'm saying? You know, like when you say, ooh, that's incredible. Mm, that's incredible. Mm. And we take that to mean good. But actually, the word credible 
is good. Incredible means not good or not true or not valid. You understand what I'm saying? Now you understand where words like, that's an incredible lie, <laughs> comes from. You see what I'm saying? During my tenure as a pastor, as an educator, as a lecturer, I have come to realize without doubt in my mind that most people easily believe what they cannot prove. And they disbelieve what they cannot disprove. Did y'all grab that? In a minute, we'll grab, digest, swallow it, and let it become a part of our nature, stuff that we cannot prove is fact. But stuff that has evidence to it, we don't want to believe it. This is especially true when it comes to the religious doctrinology that has been programmed since childhood into the minds of many sincere church folk today. And even non-church folk. Many people believe in what is called the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. In other words, that's just the theological way of saying that the entire Bible, from Genesis to the book of the Revelation, word for word, was given by God to his prophets, apostles, and servants. Most church people believe that. So that you can see where this is taken from, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Second Peter. The first chapter, the 21st verse. Second Peter, the first chapter, the 21st verse. When you have it, say Ashe. If you don't have it, say not yet. The not yet's have it. <laughs> Second Peter 121. Ashe. Gotta say Ashe. Alright. Notice what the Bible says. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, theologians and seminarians have taken this verse to say that the Bible is inspired from cover to cover. Even though it doesn't say that. That's what they made it say. And they coupled this verse that we've just read to another verse in 2 Timothy. If you turn there, a few pages backward to 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse. When you have it, say I'll shake. It says these words, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture, is that what your Bible says? It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, Doctrine for reproof, for correction, or for instruction in righteousness. Now, because those two words 
in that verse say all Scripture? People have mistaken this verse to say the whole Bible. Follow what I'm saying. When Timothy so-called wrote this letter, I'm sorry, Paul to Timothy, he was telling Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? In his letter. But now, what makes you think that Paul was talking about the letter that he was writing? He was trying to, according to this text, inform Timothy about the scriptures being the words of God. Nothing in his writing implies in any way, shape, or form that Paul was talking about the letter that he was writing. Therefore, the person who calls himself or herself a Christian is taught to believe in these things. One, the uniqueness of the Bible. That means that there's no other book on the planet like it. No other book on the planet says what the Bible says. It's called the uniqueness of the Bible. Christians are taught about the infallibility of the Bible. Meaning that if the Bible says it, you can take it to the bank. Christians are taught something else called the inerrancy of the Bible, which is the claim that the Bible does not have any errors in it. It's flawless. Another doctrine of the Bible that most Christians are taught is something called the genuineness of the Bible. It's genuine in its origin. The credibility Meaning that it can be counted on. It's true. And something called the authenticity. Meaning that it is authentic. It is the true, authentic Word of God. This is what most church folk are programmed to believe. And guess when this program begins? When they are two Yes, sir. Three, four years old. Another doctrine of the Bible that most Christians are taught is something called the genuineness of the Bible. It's genuine in its origin. The credibility, meaning that it can be counted on. It's true. And something called the authenticity, meaning that it is authentic. It is the true, authentic Word of God. This is what most church folk are programmed to believe. And guess when this program begins? When they are two, three, four years old. In fact, children at two, three, four years old who don't know how to read are taught to pledge their allegiance to a book they don't even know how to read. Little children are made to say in many churches, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. But yet they can't read it. That's deep. To pledge your allegiance and commitment to something you don't understand. But look at the person next to you and say, that's how the program works. deal very quickly with something called the authorship of the Bible. Most people have been taught 
that the Bible was written by approximately 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years. That's what I was taught. All in Sunday school, in Bible Institute, in Bible College, in seminary, they teach you that under the doctrine of inspiration that 40 men wrote the Bible. Not a woman. They left, they, they left them out for some reason or another. They taught us that 40 men wrote the Bible over a period of 1,600 years and not one of them contradicted the other. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, that the Bible as we know it, how do I say that? The Bible as we know it just came into existence in 1611. What we call the King James version of the Bible came into existence in 1611 under the auspices and by order of Jimmy Stewart. That was his name, y'all, in case y'all didn't know that. James Stewart, okay, who ordered 47 scholars, so-called scholars, of which William Shakespeare happened to have been one of them, and another man who was William Shakespeare's lover named Francis Bacon. Don't get offended. I'm just telling you the truth. You see how we see how we've been so religious, religiosized, if that's a word. <laughs> you think? I mean, like you know, I told you that these two men were gay and they were contributors to the Bible, and you got offended. Some of you it ain't my fault. King James was kind of messed up himself. He was a sick human being. Tell it like it is. The man killed his lovers after he was finished with them. Had his own mother put to death because she dared tell him that he was wrong. So he commissioned 47 so-called scholars in the year 1600. See the, see the, see the similarity? We were taught 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years. But the truth is King James commissioned 47 authors in the year 1600 to compile the Bible that we now have, and they completed the work in 1611. Oh, it's deep. For many people in the world, the Bible is held to be the final authority in all matters. Out of a thousand and one different sects, S-E-C-T-S, and denominations of Christianity, there are many different reasons why the Bible holds the position it does. One of the ultimate questions that is asked to anybody, now y'all might get this question if you haven't gotten it already. They will ask you this question. Well, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? That's all I want to know. And you try to explain to them, I want to know, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Answer me, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? That's, that's the context here. And see, when people ask you that question, all they want to hear from you is a yes or a no. That's all they want to hear. Now, the problem with that is this. When it comes to the Bible, we must realize that things are not always so black and white, as we would say. Between the two extremes are a lot of shades of gray. If one says, yes, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, you know what that means? That means, then, that you are ready to swallow every word it says, hook, line, and sinker. If you say no to that answer, as far as they are concerned, this conversation is over. I don't want to hear nothing you've got to say. 
because you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. So that's the kind of predicament we're in in this program. In fact, they'll call you Antichrist. We must always remember that the word Bible is not in the Bible. Okay? Bible, the word Bible is from the Latin word biblios, which means little book. Whenever the Bible refers to the ancient scriptures, it's always talking about the Old Testament or even earlier than that. I better say that again. Yeah. It's always talking about the Old Testament or earlier right. than that. Never do you hear the word scriptures used with reference to what is called the New Testament. Because when these references were made, the only thing that existed at the time were the ancient sacred writings. Let's deal with the concept, the Word of God. How many of you have heard that the Bible is the Word of God? You've heard that before? All right. The ancient term, ancient African term, metuneta, translated into English means, metu means Word or words, netta meaning God or gods. So when we say the metu netta, we're saying the word of God or the words of the gods. Uh -huh. But do y'all know what the metu netta really is? Metu netta is not what some white people wrote from Europe. Uh -huh. I better say that one more time for y'all. Let me just jump ahead for a moment and let y'all know. There is not one line of scripture anywhere in the world written by a white man. I better say it one more time. Because see, I know, I know, see, I know that a lot of folk here still have this thing. You know, we, we automatically think that white is something. I, I, I you know, we, still trying to grab that. You know, many have this unexplainable ex respect for white still. So I, I think you need to understand that the only thing that the white man compiled when it comes to the biblical message is the commentaries. Methuneta is not what some white people wrote from Europe. I better say that one more time for y'all. Let me just jump ahead for a moment and let y'all know. There is not one line of scripture anywhere in the world written by a white man. I better say it one more time. Because see, I know, I know, see, I know that a lot of folk here still have this thing. You know, we, we automatically think that white is something. I, I, I you know, still trying to grab that. You know, many have this unexplainable ex respect for white still. So I, I think you need to understand that the only thing that the white man compiled when it comes to the biblical message is the commentaries and the theological concepts and perspectives that have misused verses in the Bible. Y'all follow what I'm saying? The ancient sacred writings were written long before the white man even came out of the caves. You need to understand this. Now, I hope that wasn't too hard for somebody. Because I promised somebody on this week I'd try to take it easy on white folk. But I'm going to tell it like it is. They're still liars. That's the message from last week. These were the ancient writings inscribed in stone, also called by the white man hieroglyphics. Now follow this, brothers and sisters. The word hieroglyphics or hieroglyphs is a compound word. Two words, hieroglyphs. 
Hiero means sacred. Glyphs means writings. So when you see the word hieroglyphics, you're actually saying the sacred writings. We've been taught, and I'm sure most of you know, that what we call the writings of ancient Egypt, we've been calling it the hieroglyphics. The real name is the Metuneta. And you can see that clearly in my tape, African Evidence That Demands an African Verdict. I actually got it right there, the pyramid text of ancient Egypt where all of the sacred writings were copied and stolen from and put in what we now call the Bible. Right out of the pyramid of Teti the first in Saqqara. On this basis we must understand that the inspired text, the inspired text came from Egypt. What did I say, y'all? Egypt. I didn't say wrong. No, Egypt. I don't care how much power the Pope thinks he has. Nothing inspired came out of Rome. One more time. How many of y'all in here were raised as Catholics? Let me see your hand. Okay, let me reiterate it one more time. Nothing inspired came out of Rome. Guess what else, people, for those who want to assume a Jewish identity? Nothing inspired came out of Jerusalem either. All right, all right, all right. Prove me wrong. The ancient text came from the sacred writings of the true holy land, which is what we call today Kemet or Egypt. Because why are you bringing all this out? Because the only way we're going to be liberated is we got to understand how we've been lied to. As long as you don't understand the lie, you're going to keep operating within the parameters of the lie. Yeah. Once you see clearly the lie, then you'll step yourself up out of the lie. You understand? Yeah. 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 Woo, buddy. When it comes to the Bible, there are three kinds of literary witness that's easy to recognize. One is what's called the Word of God. Let me give you an example of what that is. Turn to Deuteronomy. Now I'm, just, I'm not saying that what we're about to read is the Word of God. I'm not saying that. I'm just giving you an example. Okay? Because see, when you see how these imposter Jews have compiled this thing for their benefit, Deuteronomy 18 Starting at the 17th verse. Notice what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 18, 17. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. You have it? Say, I'll say. It says, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. Mm. And the Lord said unto me, and here are supposed to be the words of God. They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now that's an example of God speaking. I didn't say it was God speaking. Y'all follow me clearly here. I didn't say it was God speaking, but since many of us are still Bible bound, let me give you an example from the Bible of what we would call the words of God speaking. Here he said, this is what the Lord said, and boom. The second witness would be considered to be the words of a prophet of God. Okay, let's look at Joshua, the sixth chapter. Let's book over. Joshua, the sixth chapter, verse six and seven. You have to say, Ashe. Ashe. All right, no problem. Just say, wait a minute. I thought that's just as good. Joshua 6 and 6. When you have it, say, Ashe. Ashe. That's a little bit more. Still got to wait. All right. Notice what it said. And Joshua 
the son of Nun, what did he do? Called the, Called the priests and said unto them, what did Joshua say? Take up the heart of the blood. Okay, you ain't got to read no more. You get the point. In other words, in this verse, Joshua is not saying, the Lord said unto me, blah. This is Joshua talking here, according to this verse. Okay? The third witness is what we call the words of a historian. Oh, follow it as well now. Look at Mark, second book of the New Testament. Mark, the first chapter, verse 21 through 28. Now, what's really deep about this, as you read this type of witness, I want you to pay close attention. The book of Mark, the first chapter, the 21st verse. You have to say, I say. It says, and they went into Capernaum. Yes. And straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Yes. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. Now what's deep about this is, here we have a third person writer. Follow me now. The persons who are involved in this account is not the person who's writing this. Uh -huh. In fact, we have here, what book is this? Mark. Mark. Mark was a, what we would almost call a knee baby at the time that this would have occurred. So Mark was writing what somebody told him yeah. happened. Are you following what I'm saying? So you cannot take the words of a historian yeah, yeah, yeah. and say that it is the words of God. Yeah, yeah. You have the word of God, you have the words of God's prophet speaking, and then you have the word of a historian. And what's really deep, brothers and sisters, is over 80% of the Bible. Fits into the third category that we just read. The word of a, a, a hearsay evidence. In a court of law, hearsay don't mean nothing. As far as the issue of the credibility of the Bible is concerned, the rule of thumb of the Bible is concerned, mm -hmm. the rule of thumb is real simple. Everybody say this with me. A book, a book. especially a sacred book, especially is, sacred credible is credible if it relates truthfully, it relates truthfully. the matters matter. on which it addresses. On which it addresses. Now, Brother Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying this, that any writing is credible if it's telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real simple. But once you misrepresent the text, it is not credible. Well, Brother Pastor, are you saying that there's been stuff that's been misrepresented in the Bible? Let's find out. Point I want to bring out is something called the false attribution of the scriptures. We want to write that down. For an example, I'll use the example we used Wednesday night in Bible class. It's just to ask the question about Isaiah 7:14. Turn there right quick. Isaiah the seventh chapter, the fourteenth verse. Let's look at this real good. Y'all ready for this? I don't know, man. If y'all ain't ready, I'll stop now. No, I ain't gonna. I, I just lied to y'all. Forgive me. I ain't gonna stop. I ain't gonna stop. If y'all ain't ready, get ready. I'm not gonna stop. I got to tell. I got to teach you the truth. Isaiah 7:14. Say it with me. Isaiah 7:14. I'm gonna read this verse, and right quick, I want some feedback from y'all. Here it is. Now, listen carefully. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin.
virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What have you been taught that that verse is talking about? Jesus, virgin birth, right? Have you been taught that? We've been taught that that's a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus. Now let me show you what I mean by false attribution. So that you'll know what false attribution is. False attribution is to say that the Bible says something that it doesn't say. And make it doctrine. Keep your finger right there, okay? Turn to Matthew, the first chapter, right quick. Let's deal with this thing here. Matthew, the first chapter, the 21st verse. This is where the angel visited Mary in this text. Matthew 121. You have it? Say, I'll shake. Here's what it said. Read it with me. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Wait a minute, call him what? Jesus. Call him Jesus, right? Yeah. For he shall save his people from their sin. And notice the 22nd verse carefully, people. Mm -hmm. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Notice what it said. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So you see in Matthew, the first chapter, they're saying, they are saying, they are saying. I'm not saying the Bible says it. They, the compilers, the theologians, the programmers, are saying that Jesus being born in the first chapter of Matthew is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. Do y'all see that? Yes. I don't want to lose you now. Y'all see that? Yes. Well, then let's read. Let's go back over to Isaiah 7.14. Right right. One more time, I'm going to read that verse. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you... Put a circle around the word you. Uh-huh. Because see, the first mistake, y'all think that you is you. First mistake, right off the bat. Who is the you in this verse? All right, sir. All right, sir. The Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Put a circle around the word virgin. There are two words for the word virgin in the Hebrew. The first word is alma. Come on, what's up? A-L-M-A-H, and the second one is Bethula. How many of y'all have ever heard of a woman named Alma before? Alma simply means young maiden. It doesn't mean a woman who's never been touched before. Bethula means a woman who's never been touched by a man. So you got two Hebrew words for the one English word, virgin. In this verse, the Hebrew word is Alma. A-L-M-A-H, which means a young maiden. Now let's read it with that right meaning. Behold, a young maiden shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Notice the next verse. Butter and honey shall he eat. Nowhere in the Bible do we read of Jesus eating butter and honey. Oh, yeah. That he, know, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now notice the 16th verse. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. What in the world is this talking about? What is this talking about? See, it's easy to make the Bible say what you want it to say if you're going to snatch a verse out of its context and fit your doctrine. And that's what they have done. This is not a prophecy about a virgin birth of Jesus. This is a prophecy to Ahaz. Look at the 10th verse. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto who? Ahaz. Ahaz. So now you know who the you is. 
In Isaiah 7, 14, Ahaz was in war, and he thought he was going to lose the war. So God sent Isaiah to Ahaz and said, listen, don't worry, I ain't going to let you be defeated in battle. Ahaz said, I'm, oh, I'm going to lose this battle, I'm going to lose this battle. So Isaiah said in the 10th verse, man, listen, ask God for a sign. Ask him for a sign. Where the 12th verse, somewhere on there? I'm not going to ask God for no sign, Ahaz says in the 12th verse. 13th verse, Isaiah says, I'm tired of y'all people. Y'all yeah. getting all freaked out, nervous and everything instead of just trusting God. 14th verse, he says, listen, God's going to give you a sign anyhow. Uh -huh. A young maiden is going to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she's going to bear a child. And his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Which is a sign to you, Ahaz, that when you go into battle, God will be with you. <laughs> That's what this is. And if you look at the 8th chapter, the very next chapter, the 3rd verse, it tells you who, this, who the child was. It says, and I went unto the prophetess, and what does it say, people? Jesus. And she conceived, and did what? Yeah. And bare a son. In other words, this son was a, Isaiah's son. The virgin was Isaiah's wife. Let's deal with something else. Let's deal with contradictions and credibility. Y'all don't mind this, do you? I got, I, I got to take, I got to take the sunglasses. I got to take the blinders off. This. Contradiction. The biblical text clearly states two different genealogies for Jesus. How many, let me ask y'all a question. How many inconsistencies do you need before you come to the realization that something is not infallible? How many? Just one inconsistency, right? One contradiction, right? Let's go to Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew, the first chapter. The 16th verse. When you have it, say, I'll share. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Do y'all see that? According to that verse, who is Jesus' granddaddy? Jacob, right? Joseph is Jesus' daddy. And Jacob is his granddaddy. Right? Right? Jacob is Joseph's father. Jacob, right? Joseph is Jesus' daddy. And Jacob is his granddad. Right? Jacob is Joseph's father. Right? All right. Now look at Luke, the third chapter. Look at Luke, the third chapter, the 23rd verse. When you have it, say, I'll shake. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Which was the son of who? I thought y'all said Jacob. I thought y'all said Jacob was Jesus' granddad. According to this verse, Heli is his granddad. So you say, well, that's a different cultural name, maybe. You know, let, let's deal. All right, then in that case, while you're in the third chapter of Luke, let's run on up the list, because all these different names are different from the first one. But let's go to where it comes back round to, uh, look at the 31st verse. Uh -huh. Which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Matata, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Now in this verse, who's David's son? So Nathan in this verse is a great, 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 Matthew 1 and 6. And Jesse begat David, the king. And David the king 
begat who? Solomon. Wait a minute now. We just read Nathan was David's son. Now who is it? Solomon or Nathan? Who is Jesus' granddaddy? Jacob or Eli? I'm going to tell you all right now. Don't lose no sleep over It's a contradiction that you will never reconcile. It's an inconsistency. How about, how about this? How about this? How many of y'all have ever heard of a jigsaw puzzle before? Yeah. I don't know if y'all like putting jigsaw puzzles together. It's a nice, you know, thing to do, waste time. But if you have a, a supposedly a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle, right? And when you pour all the puzzle pieces out on the table and start trying to put that thing together, you don't know it. All right. But there's only 342 pieces uh -huh. there. Are you going to ever put that puzzle together? Yes, you never put it together, will you? Yes, and what's sad about it is you will put all this time into trying to find out what piece goes where and putting it together. And you might get about 20-something pieces together in a little section that you found. And you start saying, oh, I'm beginning to see this thing now. Uh -huh. And based on the little bit of the puzzle that you did put together, you think you got the whole picture. Uh -huh. That's what's going on with us. Yeah, that's right. Good example. We have been told only parts of what has been plagiarized. Am I making sense, people? How are you going to get the whole picture when you intentionally remove some of the pieces from the puzzle? Well, there are some books that they removed. Come on, books. What makes you say that, Pastor? Let's find out. Turn to Numbers 21 14. How can it be credible when I got these omissions here? Numbers 21 14. When you get it, say I say. Now, Jeff, all right. Numbers 21 14. Notice what it says. Wherefore it is said, read it, people, what does it say? In the book of the In the book of the what? Wars of the Lord. In the book of the wars of the Lord. Where is that book? <laughs> took it out. Took it out. Where is it? What information is contained in that book? That might give you some more puzzle pieces uh, to that program. Yes, sir. Mm. The book evidently must have existed, right? I mean, let's put it this way. Right here in the Bible, it refers to that book. So it ain't like I'm making up that name. Let's look at another one. Turn to Joshua. A couple of more books over. 10th chapter, the 13th verse. Turn quickly now, I'm running out of time. I'm going to start reading. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of what? Jasher. Where is that book? It's missing. Somebody stole it. Where is the book of Jasha? I want to see what contents, what information is there. Oh, y'all, let's look at another one. Turn to First Chronicles twenty-nine. In fact, uh, yeah, First Chronicles twenty-nine, twenty-nine. First Chronicles twenty-nine, twenty-nine. Now, some of y'all didn't know nothing about these books. Just like a lot of y'all didn't know Moses' daddy's name. And see, they didn't tell you Moses' daddy's name for a reason. Because see, Moses' daddy was also Moses' first cousin. Woo! 
Moses' daddy married his aunt. And gave and she gave birth to Moses and Aaron. So Moses' children were also his first cousins. It's called incest, y'all. They don't want you to know that the great teacher of the Hebrew people came here through incest. So they just don't tell you about Amram. A-M-R-A-M. That was Moses' daddy, y'all. According to the biblical text. Mm. Notice... First Chronicles 1 Chronicles uh, 29, 29. Now the acts of David the king, first and last, behold, are they not written in the book of Samuel the seer? Where is that book? And in the book of Nathan the prophet? Where is the book of Nathan? And the book of Gad the seer? There are three more books. Right there. Where are they? The Bible refers to them. Turn over to the next book, Second Chronicles 9, 29. A few more pages go over to the ninth chapter of the next book. 29th verse. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet and then the prophecy of ah Ahiah, uh -huh. the Shalomite, and the visions of Edo? Where are these? Where's the book of the visions of Edo? What is contained in these books? That might tell us the truth about the liar. See, usually when there's something they don't want you to see. Let me close, y'all. I, I, I could, I, I'll be honest with you. I could go on the rest of the day. But I'm almost out of tape. <laughs> this last thing called interpolations. Yes, yes. To interpolate means to polish, to dress up, uh -huh. to alter, to change it, to enlarge it, or to corrupt it yes. by putting in new words, by putting in new subject matter. Yes, yes. As an example, and I, the, the first interpolation that I can think of is Mark, the 16th chapter. Everybody turn in. Second book of the New Testament. Now, I'm going gonna, gonna to close on this. This will be enough right here. Like I said, there's so much more that I could share with you. But the first thing I must... The first thing I must do to liberate you from captivity yeah. is show you the true nature of your captors. Oh. Did y'all hear what I said? Yeah. In order to liberate you from captivity, you must see and understand, whether you like it or not, the true nature of your captors. In Mark 16... The eighth verse, it says, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Do y'all see that? Yes, yes. Now, how many, let me see the hands of people in this room who's got some more verses in their Bible for this chapter. Raise your hand if there's some more verses there. In other words, after the 8th verse, is there 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th verse? There's some more verses? All the way to 20, huh? Now this is deep, people. Let me tell you what's deep about this. Follow this well. Mark stops at the end of the 8th verse. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know what kind of Bibles y'all have in here today, but is there anybody in here who has a Bible with the notation at the end of the 8th verse? Is there anybody here that got a notation at the end of the 8th verse, like NIV, New International Version of the Bible? Anybody got that here? You don't have your? Okay, I'll lift mine. All right, is there anybody that got a footnote about verses 9 through 20 in their Bible? You got one, Dee? 
You have, what does it say? No, no, I just got, I put it before like I didn't have it. It actually says that? No, no, no. Oh, you put it in there. Now, I want somebody whose Bible actually says it. Nobody's Bible actually says that? What kind of Bibles y'all got? Y'all just, I know y'all just got devotional reading Bibles. There's just, you know, so y'all, that's why you need study Bibles. So when you're dealing with the, 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 the that's deep. Nobody's Bible says this. Verses 9 through 20. There should be a notation somewhere in your Bible, maybe at the bottom of the page somewhere. If, oh, you got one, Linda? Look, read it nice and loud. What does it say? The earlier manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses, what does it say? Do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Thank you. Now there it is right there in the book. The scholars know it. So then how did verses 9 through 20 get in there? Somebody added them in there. That's called interpolation. Now what's deep about it, people, which y'all don't understand, is it was added somewhere between the 4th and 6th century. Now I'm getting ready to drop something on y'all that's going to blow your mind. Who in here has a red letter edition of the Bible? Now I see some hands. Y'all got those words of Jesus in red, don't you? Now this is deep. Let's, now, now, now we're going to read verses 9 through 20. I'm going to read them real fast. But as I read them, I want you to keep in mind, even though a lot of these words are in red letters in your Bible, keep in mind that these were added centuries later, so Jesus couldn't have said it. Verse 9 through 20. Now, when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, first thing we got right off the bat is it says, now when Jesus was risen. In other words, the, we don't even hear about the resurrection story until they add these verses. The first day of the week he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven doubles. Tenth verse. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Eleventh verse. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had seen her, been seen of her, believed not. Twelfth verse. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Thirteenth verse. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Fourteenth verse. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Fifteenth verse. Now this is what's deep. This is deep, people. Fifteenth verse. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. Keep in mind, now, this wasn't there. This was added. This is called false attribution. In other words, somebody decided to put these words in Jesus' mouth. You don't have to take my word for it. Go liberate yourself. Look at the person next to you and say, set yourself free. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Seventeen verse, and this is from a Pentecostal brothers and sisters. And these signs shall follow them that believe. For in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Oh, this is deep. Because there's a couple of verses I just read is the second foundational pillar to the Pentecostal church. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Says who? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The Egyptians pronounce it Amen. Brothers and sisters, 
I hope that you will take the information you've heard today and not let, don't take it as information to go out and tell other people they're wrong. That's not why I shared this information with you. I shared this information with you to liberate you from the grasp of your oppressor. Because the very thing that your oppressor has been using is the very thing that you don't want to back away from. And that's the belief system that they gave you. If we as a people are going to ever be free, we're going to have to first realize that we knew God long before the white man had an awareness that he was even alive. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It amazes me how a people who have at least a 75,000 year history can all of a sudden not know who God is and be lost and undone and on their way to hell until they believe what somebody who just came out of a cage a few thousand years ago want to make you believe. you keep buying into that mess, you will always be a slave. You will look like an African. You may even learn how to speak Kiswahili. You may understand the Metuneta and how to read it backward and forward. But as long as you're still stuck in their parameters of thinking, you're still a slave. And whenever they get ready, they will give you orders. And you will say, your order shall be obeyed. Without even realizing you're saying it. And guess what, brothers and sisters, they do it. Every time we start coming together as a people, they pull their little strings in our psycho viscera. And then the first thing you want to come and say, but do you believe in Jesus? Isn't that deep? We can come together on everything else. That one little line, that one question divides us. It's time for our resurrection and empowerment. Yeah. The message I want to share with you today is entitled Christianity and World Conquest. Now, if I don't get to turn to a Bible verse or to liberate you from captivity, yeah. is show you the true nature of your captors. Oh. Did y'all hear what I said? In order to liberate you from captivity, you must see and understand, whether you like it or not, the true nature of your captors. In Mark 16, the eighth verse, it says, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Do y'all see that? Yes, yes. Now, how many, let me see the hands of people in this room who's got some more verses in their Bible for this chapter. Raise your hand if there's some more verses there. In other words, after the 8th verse, is there 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th verse? There's some more verses? All the way to 20, huh? Now this is deep, people. Let me tell you what's deep about this. Follow this well. Mark stops at the end of the eighth verse. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know what kind of Bibles y'all have in here today, but is there anybody in here who has a Bible with the notation at the end of the eighth verse? Is there anybody here that got a notation at the end of the verse, like NIV, New International Version of the Bible? Anybody got that here? You don't have your? Okay, I'll lift mine. All right. Is there anybody that got a footnote about verses 9 through 20 in their Bible? You got one, D? I got 
You have, what does it say? No, no, I just got it. I tell you this before, I got it in the it, it actually says that? Oh, you put it in there. Now, I want somebody whose Bible actually says it. Nobody's Bible actually says that? What kind of Bibles y'all got? Y'all just, I know y'all just got devotional reading Bibles. There's just, you know, so y'all, that's why you need study Bibles. So when you're dealing with the, 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 the that's deep. Nobody's Bible says this? Verses 9 through 20. There should be a notation somewhere in your Bible, maybe at the bottom of the page somewhere. If, oh, you got one, Linda? Look, read it nice and loud. What does it say? The earlier manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses, what does it say? Do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Thank you. Right. Now there it is right there in the book. The scholars know it. So then how did verses 9 through 20 get in there? Somebody added them in there. That's called interpolation. Now what's deep about it, people, which y'all don't understand, is it was added somewhere between the 4th and 6th century. Now I'm getting ready to drop something on y'all that's going to blow your mind. Has a red letter edition of the Bible. Now I see some hands. Y'all got those words of Jesus in red, don't you? Now this is deep. Let's now 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 we're gonna read verses nine through twenty. I'm gonna read them real fast. But as I read them, I want you to keep in mind, even though a lot of these words are in red letters in your Bible. Keep in mind that these were added centuries later, so Jesus couldn't have said it. Verse 9 through 20. Now, when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, first thing we got right off the bat is it says, now when Jesus was risen. In other words, the, we don't even hear about the resurrection story until they add these verses. The first day of the week he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven doubles. Tenth verse. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Eleventh verse. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had seen her, been seen of her, believed not. Twelfth verse. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Thirteenth verse. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Fourteenth verse. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Fifteenth verse. Now this is what's deep. This is deep, people. Fifteenth verse. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. Keep in mind, now, this wasn't there. This was added. This is called false attribution. In other words, somebody decided to put these words in Jesus' mouth. You don't have to take my word for it. Go liberate yourself. Look at the person next to you and say, set yourself free. Them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. 17 verse, and this is from a Pentecostal brothers and sisters. And these signs shall follow them that believe. For in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Oh, this is deep. Because there's a couple of verses I just read is the second foundational pillar to the Pentecostal church. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Says who? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The Egyptians pronounce it Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope 
hope that you will take the information you've heard today and not let, don't take it as information to go out and tell other people they're wrong. That's not why I shared this information with you. I shared this information with you to liberate you from the grasp of your oppressor. Because the very thing that your oppressor has been using is the very thing that you don't want to back away from. And that's the belief system that they gave you. If we as a people are going to ever be free, we're going to have to first realize that we knew God long before the white man had an awareness that he was even alive. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It amazes me how a people who have at least a 75,000 year history can all of a sudden not know who God is and be lost and undone and on their way to hell until they believe what somebody who just came out of the caves a few thousand years ago want to make you believe. As long as you keep buying into that mess, you will always be a slave. You will look like an African. You may even learn how to speak Kiswahili. You may understand the Metuneta and how to read it backward and forward. But as long as you're still stuck in their parameters of thinking, you're still a slave. And whenever they get ready, they will give you orders. And you will say, your order shall be obeyed. Without even realizing you're saying it. And guess what, brothers and sisters, they do it. Every time we start coming together as a people, they pull their little strings in our psycho viscera. And then the first thing you want to come and say, but do you believe in Jesus? Isn't that deep? We can come together on everything else. That one little line, that one question divides us. It's time for our resurrection and empowerment. Peace forever and always. Welcome to another edition of the Realities Temple on Earth. Your host is his divine masculine brother, Administer Talik IBNRAD.